Terry, can you hear me? Yes, I can. Hello, everyone. I want to welcome all of you to the Ergonomics Awareness Training this morning. My name is Terry Reed, and I'm the Strategic Employment Program Manager for the department. So glad all of you were able to attend this morning's session. I want to go over a few housekeeping rules before I bring on the speaker. I ask that you put your phones on hold un until and hold your questions until the end of the session. You should be able to type your questions in, and Terry will be glad to answer any questions that you have. And also, um, mute your phones and do not place them on hold for us. Now, today's speaker, Terry Snyder, is a senior ergonomics consultant from PS Associates LLC in Delaware. Terry has 25 years of ergonomic consulting to include industry, universities, municipalities, healthcare, and federal government. Terry, if you would go ahead. Sure. Good morning, everybody, and an especially early good morning to those of you that are tuning in from the West Coast. Um, I understand this was a sellout. Uh, webinar, so I know there's a lot of interest in this topic, and I'm happy to be able to present today. A little bit about myself, just very quickly. One second. There we go. Uh, then, uh, just a little bit about myself, um, and I think Terry covered this pretty well, that I have been consulting for 25 years in a lot of different environments. And just for fair disclosure, I am up in the Northeast. Uh, in the Boston area, uh, and I am a survivor of the blizzard of 78 and the blizzard of 2015, uh, and I'm not quite that smart because I'm still living up here. Uh, I'd like to go a little bit through the agenda of what we're going to cover today. There's a lot to cover. I'd like to talk a little bit about what's ergonomics, uh, what can cause a musculoskeletal injury. Uh, what's the importance of neutral posture? And that's something you uh, have a lot of control over. So we're going to look at that. We're going to focus on ergonomics for computer users. And we are also going to uh, talk a little bit at the end about uh, safe lifting. So here we go. What's ergonomics? Well, ergonomics is fitting the job to the worker. It improves safety. It improves comfort. It improves ease of performing the job, and when the job is easier to do, it also improves productivity. And a lot of studies have shown it also improves the quality of work. Now, when we look at different musculoskeletal injuries, we can put them in two categories. One category is uh, things that happen as an acute event, like slip, trips, falls, breaks, cuts. Uh, the other are things that happen over time, they're cumulative, uh, not from a single event. And these types of injuries also affect all age groups. And what's kind of sad is they're often preventable, but they're not prevented. And that's what we're going to look at today. And how can we help um, decrease the risk of having these injuries? Because they can be prevented. So depending on what job you're doing, and it doesn't really matter, um, the, uh, the risk factors are pretty much the same. So let's look at what the risk factors are. There's force, which is number one. It's about three times more than any of the others, and we'll talk a bit about force. There's awkward posture. There's static posture, which is basically keeping the same posture, even if it's a good one, for very long periods of time. There's repetition, which is, is something um, in itself, not a risk factor, but it exposes you to all these other risk factors. There's contact stress, so if you're using a tool that digs into your hand or the edge of the desk is digging into you, that's contact stresses. And there's just stress on the job that translates, and a lot of psychosocial um, uh, risk factors that also translate into injury. So those are your risk factors. Um, let's talk a little bit about uh, uh, awkward posture. The opposite of awkward posture would be neutral posture. And for any of you that have done yoga, you've heard this term neutral posture. So let's quickly look at what that means, because these are the building blocks of what we're going to look at later when we look at good computer setup. So what we have here with the shoulder is the shoulder should be relaxed. 
and the elbow should be somewhat near the side, just within 30 degrees, not behind. The elbow shouldn't be behind the back or ahead of the back. And this gives you basically a nice relaxed shoulder. The, um, the, the hand should be straight, and we'll talk a lot more about hand posture later, but the hand should be straight, the wrist and the hands. The feet should be well supported, either on the floor or, or a footrest. Um, and that, in a lot of ways, gives you back support. The back should be straight when you're standing, and that is where you can produce maximum force and be very comfortable, or should be back in the chair to let the chair do the work and not you. And your head and your neck should be straight. So your head and your neck is supported by your back, which, if you're seated, is also supported by the chair. Typically, these are the midpoint of the range of motion of the joint, and it's where you're more relaxed. Um, and where also you can produce the most maximum strength so you don't fatigue as quickly. So if you look at this example, which is from industry, but this is also true for people working at desks, is you look at this and you know that her shoulders are hurting. And you look here and you see her shoulders are relaxed. So it's going from non-neutral to neutral. So if you take nothing away from this class, take this away, that the farther you're away from neutral posture or the longer you're away from neutral posture, you don't have to be out of it very much, but if you're out of it for a long period of time, your usable strength lowers, and then your muscles get tired. I mean, she's really tired. And then you get more, you experience more discomfort, and you can move right up that, that curve into injury. So neutral posture is very important. So I want to focus on computers, because I think that's a common job task that probably all of you tuning in, I think we may have, we have up to about 96 people here today, a common job tasks that people have. So let's talk, we're going to talk a little bit about how to set up your computer workstation. So I'm going to give you homework, and hopefully you'll go back to your computer workstations and make some changes, and also changing some of the critical behaviors that you do at your workstation to make you more comfortable. So computers are wonderful things. I mean, they've really helped our, certainly our ergonomics and our efficiency, um, for sure. But the big uh, problem is kind of how we sit at our desk and for the long periods of time that we have to sit at our desk. So if I show you this picture, this woman um, looks like something from the Exorcist movie. I don't know if any of you have seen it, but it looks like her head is turned all the way around. But she's not sitting back in her chair. She may as well be on a stool. And we're going to talk a little bit why people don't sit back in their chairs. A lot of times there's good reason for it. She's um, leaning forward on her arms. They're cutting into the sharp desk. Her, elbow, her shoulders are all the way up. Um, probably the reason she's leaning is because she can't support her shoulders up like that. Her head is turned all the way around, probably because her monitor is all the way out to the side because that's where it was put originally. And this person is certainly extremely uncomfortable. Um, so let's look a little bit of how, how should people sit. And to do this, I'm going to give you some building blocks, um, starting um, with this sort of cartoon. I mean, this person is not, nobody sits exactly like this, but I think it gives you the building blocks. I think it gives you the building blocks for what we're doing here. So I'm going to start at the bottom, at the feet, and I'm going to work up. And that's a good way for you to adjust your desk. So let's start at the bottom. His feet are weight-bearing, either on the floor or a footrest, but they're weight-bearing. They're planted. They're not just touching. The seat pan is long enough to pretty much cover his legs except for a couple inches so it doesn't cut into the back of his knee and he can actually sit back in the chair. So this long seat pan supports his back. This is a lousy chair, but it shows you, for somebody working for a long period of time, but it really shows you how the chair fits the lumbar curve of the person's back. And hopefully it's a long chair and it's fitting the whole back, giving him back support and all, encouraging him to sit back in it because it's comfortable. His shoulders are relaxed, which we talked about. His elbows are somewhere near his side, and his arms and hands are straight. His head and neck are supported by his back in the chair, and he's looking straight across um, 
and, and we'll talk about there's some different ways you adjust the screen, but he's looking straight across um, with his head nice and straight and supported by his back. So that's neutral. I mean, that, that is sitting about as neutral as you can, and that's a good setup, and that's what we want to look at. Feet supported, seat pan, back, shoulders, elbows near the side, straight wrist, head, head and neck. So that's what we want to look at as we proceed. Those are the building blocks. To do that, you, the chair has to fit. And so you, the, the lumbar curve needs to support your back. The seat pan depth has to be right. This one actually looks a little deep for her, but the seat pan has to be right. Height of the chair has to be right for typing, so she can type with this relaxed shoulder. The, um, and it also has to match the style of how people work. And uh, we'll talk about that in a minute. But basically, you need to know your chair. What does it do? And often I go in and do assessments, and, and the chair has adjustments that people don't know about. And when I adjust them, they're very happy. So figure out what your chair does. Sometimes you have to look under it to figure out. If you know the name of the chair, go on the Internet, and a lot of times they will have all the adjustments for the chair. But a, a, a lot of times you can figure it out by looking under the chair. The um, seat pan depth, sometimes you, you, you don't. If somebody's very short and this seat pan is too deep, they're going to sit on the edge of the seat. They, they can't sit back and bend their knees. If, um, or if they're very tall and they bring out the seat pan, I just see the relief on somebody's face because all of a sudden they have better back support. The lumbar curve, a lot of times chair backs do go up and down to really make people comfortable and fit their back. Of course, the height of the chair. Um, the chair, and you really don't want to tolerate a broken chair, right? I mean, the chair should be able to go up and down. Um, the t seat tilt, and we'll talk about that in a minute when people want to change the tilt of the chair. Sometimes even the whole chair tilts to take the pressure off the thigh. Um, sometimes there's a rocking mechanism, which I don't really have time to go into, but, but look it up. See if your chair has it. Sometimes you can uh, still get back support but have a little bit of dynamic rocking, which is very nice because your back is in a static when you're sitting. And also, your chair arms go up and down and back and forth, or sometimes they're just in the way and you want to remove them. So you want to know how your chair works. So when I learned to type, which was back when the dinosaurs roamed the earth, I was taught to sit absolutely upright. Actually, somebody I was learning on a typewriter, and somebody came around and would hit you in the back. I mean, you really had to be upright. But that's not what OSHA is talking about anymore. There's a lot of different ways to sit. So let's talk about three. One is upright. Again, right, we've got the feet, seat pan, back, shoulders, elbows, straight, head, right? You have all the components. She's fine. But look at this one. This is reclined. A lot of people, especially when they're tall or they have lower back discomfort kind of chronically, they like to recline. Um, people do that in cars. Uh, truck drivers like to sit that way. They find it very comfortable. It takes a lot of pressure off the back. It's fine if that's how you like to sit. It's fine. And pretty much, I mean, I don't like this chair because the seat pan's not deep enough, but it's the same thing. Feet, seat pan, back, head and neck. It's fine. Um, that is a perfectly good way to sit. Here's another good way to sit, and that's tipped forward. You see how this is tipped forward? She has a little more weight on her feet, but everything's still the same, right? Feet, seat pan, back, shoulders, head. Everything's still the same. And this is particularly good for people that hunt and peck. And I find people that are incredibly fast typers, they've been working for a long time, but they do not touch type, or they touch type and they don't trust it. So they tip forward because if not, their head's bobbing up and down looking at the keyboard. And that's perfectly fine to sit forward if your chair has the ability to do that. Um, that this is also a very valid way to sit. So you have to look at, think of your particular style. Let's talk a little bit about typing height. So your typing and your mouse height. Um, so let's talk a little bit about that vertical height. And this is like Goldilocks and the Three Bears. So here, this person's up too high, and their wrists are um, extended, and that's a forceful extension. Here, they're too low. They must be sitting on the floor here. But so they're flexed, and they're also coming in contact with the sharp edge of the desk that could cut off circulation. And this is just right, right, where the, where the hand is straight. And it's fine. People do not need wrist rests. In this case, has helped this person, but most people don't need it. Just a straight, a straight wrist. So let's look a little bit at the hand posture. The hand moves in four different ways. It um, uh, flexes like this. It extends, um, 
and it goes a little bit towards the um, thumb, uh, that's radial deviation, and it goes a little bit toward, and it goes a lot towards the pinky. Matter of fact, it'll go so there's almost a straight line right down the arm, right down the thumb. If you're doing that, you're as deviated as far as you can go, and um, that, and you'll fatigue faster because this is neutral for the wrist, which is absolutely straight. And the wrist also is interesting because it has the carpal tunnel, and all kinds of things go through the wrist in something that's made out of the, the tunnels made out of bone and ligament and it doesn't give. So if you are flexing a lot and you start to get some swelling, there's no place for that to go and then you get numbness in your hands. And, um, and so you really, I mean, if I had cables, I wouldn't be sitting there flexing them all day, even electronic cables. I, we want to keep that straight. Um, the, um, so a lot of people, they, this woman has tried to do the best thing. She's tried to use a footrest, but her shoulders are still a little bit high. So there's keyboard trays, and keyboard trays can pretty much be connected to anything, um, including in your homes. They can be pretty much connected to anything uh, with a good, you know, a, a ergonomic product supplier can come in and do that, or maybe your building and grounds department can do that. And, um, and that allows her to actually work in a much more comfortable shoulder posture. So let's talk about foot rests, because we talked about those. And here, this person just has their legs dangling, which means the circulation is getting caught here, and they're also floating on the chair with really no back support. So you don't want to be doing this. This person may compensated for that by slipping to the edge of the chair. So he also has no back support because he's trying to get foot support, but it's also digging in right here. So you don't want to do that. So you want to use a footrest, and you want to use a deck-type footrest, not one that rolls around. Or You want something you can really plant your feet on. If you want to try this, and I do this all the time when I go in to do assessments, get a ream of paper that's packaged. It's usually about two inches. Put some rubber bands around it so it doesn't slip, and then you can put another one on top of it or two side by side, whatever you need for the proper height. And usually when people do this and they need it, they automatically get a lot of back support. So, um, or they can raise their chair at that point. So good thing to do when you go back to your desk if you feel like you need foot rest, try some paper reams and rubber bands and see if that makes a difference for you. And, and then you can order a... Um, footrest if you need that. The, um, uh, the mouse placement, the mouse should be very close to the side of the keyboard and in this case this person um, is, has a choice. With her mouse out that far she's either out with her shoulder, so she's way out of neutral with her shoulder, or she's had to turn her wrist so it's completely ulnar deviated going towards her pinky you know, twisted towards her pinky to get the mouse here. Here what she did was put it right in front of her shoulder. And in this case, she used a bridge. And I think that bridge is something like $19. The, these are not expensive. Maybe some of the more fancy ones go up to 35 But these are not, um, I'm sure I'm not exactly accurate on that, but these are not expensive computer accessories. And in this case, she's right-handed. She doesn't use her numerics pad that much. When she does, she moves this away. She can use the numbers on top, and she can work right in front of her shoulder. So look at that, and there's some other products. Never reach up like this. Um, that, that's really bad for your wrist, and because she's down to use the keyboard tray, so here her wrist is extended, and she's reaching from her shoulder. You really want to put it right down next to the keyboard. And here are some products that are good. The mouse bridges we talked about, but there are also keyboard trays that have either they're wide enough for the mouse or they also can go right over the numeric pad if you're right-handed and not using the numeric pad too much. Um, monitor placement. You want to look at the monitor, look directly across, oh, maybe about a third of the way down the screen. In most cases, I'll show you some exceptions. And the monitor usually is about an arm's length away or closer if that's easier for you to read. But closer isn't better because you have to really focus hard as it gets closer. So you need to really set the depth, up, the distance up for comfort. But typically it's about an arm's length. And if you have more than one screen, and I bet some people tuning in have more than one screen, it's becoming more and more popular. You want the big screen directly in front of you, the main screen that you, or if you have two the same size, the screen you mostly use directly in front of you, and the other one a little bit off to the side of that, 
Use that side one as a reference screen. Sometimes that's your laptop screen. Use that as a reference screen, but mainly work directly in front of you. Bring it, if you're not just glancing at that, bring it in front of you and work in front of you, and your neck will thank you. Um, people that have graduated lens, lenses, like I have progressive lenses, people have bifocals, trifocals. The problem with that is you set your neck for the focus, so it's a static neck posture all day long. For some people, like in this case, he needs to lower the screen and he'd be in a more comfortable pro uh, neck posture, but he would still be in a static neck posture all day long because that's where the focal length is. So definitely set monitors at comfortable neck height. Sometimes that's very low, whatever's comfortable for the person. But to vary the neck posture, you may want to talk to your eye doctor about computer glasses, and they're meant for arms with, uh, distance away and it'll allow you to move your neck around all day long. And I use those. I keep a set of computer glasses near my computer, and I use those. Other things that to prevent neck pain, you don't want your neck turned to the side all day. So if you need a dock stand, use one that's in line. Um, if you have to be on the phone all day and the computer at the same time, and you're doing this, which is both force and it's force with your neck deviated. So that's like the perfect storm. Um, I'm sure she's in pain. I bet, um, whoop, sorry about that. Um, just uh, go back here. I'm sure she is experiencing discomfort and probably is a headset user um, candidate. Uh, clipboards also help you because you could prop them up when you need a dock stand, but you can also bring things to you to write so you're not bending over your keyboard to write at the desk. So clipboards are wonderful for back and, and, and neck relief. Um, some people, and, and this is not, this is very few of you have elbow issues, and sometimes that's golf elbow, tennis elbow, epicondylitis, whatever it is, you have some elbow issue. And it's interesting, if you turn your wrist, rotate your wrist, you'll realize it doesn't happen at the wrist, it happens at the elbow. And where it connects to the, the bones connect to the elbow, it wasn't such a great design. And so when your hand is flat, these two bones are crossed, which causes pressure at the elbow. For most of us, that's not a problem at all. For other people, they need special products. And again, it's rare you're going to need this. But if you need it because you have one of these elbow issues, you can use a keyboard like this that will get your hands more in that handshake orientation so the bone is uncrossed. So you could use one of these keyboards that tent or one of these that wave. You can use all kinds of different um, mice. This is a vertical mouse. There's some that aren't quite that radical, but will get you more into a handshake orientation. They also have a roller mouse that is a bar that rolls in front of you um, to control the mouse. So these are just some products that you might want to use if you have a problem with your elbow. So let's kind of move on here. Laptops. I want to talk about laptops because so many people use them incorrectly. They're not meant for prolonged use because this is the kind of posture you go into. You can't help it because the screen is so low. So basically, you want to set up a docking center. And this is true at home, too. I mean, if you're just checking your email for three minutes, that's wonderful. But if you're going to be on it for a prolonged period of time, you want to raise your laptop and use maybe a wireless keyboard and mouse. Or you can um, use a slave monitor and use your keyboard as your input device, whatever you want to do. Or set up a more formal docking station, which you can find. But you don't want to long-term directly work on your laptop. I want to talk a little bit about some behaviors. So I want to talk a little bit about using the mouse. And these things are up, are up to you, and they take a little time to get used to, but they're really efficient once you do. So one thing I recommend is using keyboard shortcuts, because mice are really difficult. Traditional mice, usually when people use them a lot, they um, hover over them when they're not using them, because they use them so much they don't want to take their hand away. And that hovering is a forced extension of your wrist. So it's force in a, in a really poor wrist posture. Um, and you, you're pretty much leaving it there all day. So try to learn some keyboard shortcuts. And you can go on just a search on the internet on keyboard shortcuts, put in your type of operating system, and put in the program. 
and you'll come up with some ideas. And learn like 10 of them. That's your homework. Learn 10 of them, and you'll find that you'll cut your time on the uh, mouse, which will, uh, which will allow you to take your hand away from it when you're not using it. So learn some keyboard shortcuts, and they're very efficient. So usually when people use them, they like them, they keep using them. Get your hand off the mouse when you're not using it. Alternate hands if you can. And if you are, let's say, a right-hand user and you put it on the left hand, you do want to you do want to change the, go on the computer and change the program so you're still uh, clicking symmetrically. So your, your left click is still, on your right hand, is still going to be the index finger on the left hand. If, so that helps your brain not get too confused when you change hands. Some people use two mice. They put one on each hand, and they take their non-dominant hand, and they use that for gross functions that are, you know, they don't need a lot of coordination for, and then they save their dominant hand for real precision mouse work. So think about your mouse, and then they're all different types of mice. Try not to use the mouse wheel. Use your up and down arrows, because that's a pretty high force repetitive function. And try to keep your wrist straight. Um, don't sink down into a wrist rest. Don't sink down onto the table surface, because then you're pushing your hand into this extended, um, uh, poor posture. So that's, that's the mouse. Let's talk about some other critical behaviors, and that's you really don't want to stay seated or standing all day long. So if you can, find a way to vary that. And sometimes you have to trick yourself. Like every time the phone rings, you stand. Move your, move your printer away so you stand. If you have to read something or write something, stand. And there, I'm, I don't have time to go into it on the seminar, but they're fairly inexpensive um, standing stations that can be installed on desks. So look into some of that. Sit back um, if, if, if you want to work, you feel like you want to work standing. Um, sit back in the chair um, so that um, the chair does the work. You don't want to be leaning forward. Um, keep your feet weight bearing, we talked about. Don't hover over your input devices, either your keyboard or your mouse. Stretch during the day. Stretching is good, but what's more important is strengthen your upper body and your abs. You need strong upper body and abs to to work on the computer uh, for long periods of time. Um, so if you don't belong to a health club, you may want to think about that or set up some equipment at home. So if you're medically able to do it, um, be, keep those things really strong and stay fit. Uh, nutrition, hydration during the day, good nutrition, uh, sleep, um, controlling um, your stress levels, all of those things really help um, because that will translate into stress in your body really, really, um, really help you. Um, so now I want to talk about uh, different ways that people sit at their desks and simple ways to correct this, because these are problem ways of sitting. So what I want to ask you to do, and this is homework, is go back to your office and ask somebody to take a picture of you working at your desk, maybe a couple, one from the back, one from, from the side, and um, look at those pictures and see if you can identify if you are one of these particular sitters. And I'm going to call them the leaner, the percher, the reacher, and the craner. And see if you can identify, and we're going to talk a little bit about how you can correct, because none of these are what you want to be doing. So let's talk about the leaner with shoulder pain. And these are all pictures from people that I have worked with that were nice enough to let me use their pictures. So here is somebody, I mean, look at them. They're leaning forward. They may as well be given a stool. They, they're not using the back of their chair at all. So why are they leaning forward? Well, um, in this case, the table was too high. So we raised up her um, chair, gave her a foot rest. In the beginning, it was paper reams and rubber bands, and then she got a foot rest. And um, so it's something you can resolve immediately and add, um, and that resolved her problem. And when she did that, she actually could move her keyboard closer. The reason she had it far away was because she couldn't hold her arms up. She got too tired, so she moved her keyboard back to support her arms. So look at the difference, and, and her back is supported by the chair, so the difference between this picture and this picture. And this is moved forward. So that that's one leaner. Let's look at another leaner. This person. Um, has back and neck pain, and he, um, but he's a recliner. He's got, he's very tall. He's got a history of back pain, and he uh, really likes to recline on this chair. Well, of course, this isn't helping him at all. He did the same thing. He moved everything out so he could lean, um, he could lean forward, and he, um, so basically, 
and his chair also was like a little doll's chair for him, way too small for him. So here he is in a chair that fits him. So he is leaning back, which he finds comfortable, and here's a keyboard tray that will tilt with him, and this solved this issue. And so, um, so try a keyboard tray sometimes, and a foot. But he also is on a footrest to make this all work, and in this particular desk height. So these are ways that a leaner can resolve. I would start first probably with the foot, just the footrest and raising the chair, and then there are other things that you can do. All right, so the percher. So um, this is somebody who's leaning forward. Well, why is she leaning forward like this? I used to say, what's wrong with this picture, but you can't tell me you don't like her sweater. But basically, she's leaning forward for a lot of reasons. One could be the chair's too deep for her if she sat back. She couldn't bend her knees. The other thing is, look how her leg wells are blocked. So she basically can't move in. And also, sometimes the monitor, the keyboards are just too far away, so people have to lean forward, you know, scoot forward to be able to see them. So this was very, fairly easy to correct. And sometimes you can get a back cushion that allows you to um, uh, sit back when somebody is petite, or, or sometimes there is a um, sliding seat pan and they, somebody doesn't know it or sometimes they need a new chair. In her case, I think what it was was just clearing out all the stuff under her desk and that allowed her to sit back and slide in. Okay, how about the, the recliner reacher? Here's somebody who is reaching and of course I, I, I hate to think what his shoulders are like. And um, so he may benefit from a positive tilt keyboard tray. And in this case, he, he, but, but he kept the mouse up on the table, so it's too high, so he needs to put that mouse down next to him. So that's, a, that, that's an example of somebody who is reaching. And it, usually it's because their desk doesn't match their sitting style. A lot of times that's the case. I also see it a lot when people work in cubicles, and I don't know if any of you are in cubicles, but a lot of times you're sitting in the, for whatever reason, everybody puts their computer right in the corner. And that's a problem place to have it because um, these sides block people's arms and they can't move the chair in because the chair arms hit the side and everything is just too deep. And the way to solve this is pretty easy. It's just move the whole computer system to one leg of the desk and then you minimize your reach and the, and the arms of the chair and your arms aren't blocked by these edges of the desk. So that's something to think about if you're in a, a cubicle. Um, okay. And the craner, the last one is the craner, and she's leaning forward. Well, why is she leaning forward? Well, she's leaning forward, and, and what could she do about that? Well, I think the monitor's too high, so she could lower the monitor. She might um, if she was wearing uh, progressive lenses, she might try computer lenses, and that would keep her from a weird neck angle. She could move the monitor closer, and she could increase the font size, and that would keep her from craning her neck, which is very uncomfortable because her head and her neck is no longer supported by her back and her chair. So those are just some things. So go take those pictures. Go back to your office, take some pictures. I know this um, presentation is available to you in a PDF form, and and see if you can solve some of your problems and be more comfortable. The last thing I want to do, and I just really want to quickly do it because I want a lot of time for questions, is I want to talk a little bit about um, I want to talk a little bit about um, uh, lifting because a lot of people have to lift in their jobs, and that came up as, a, as something that is very important to you all. And so. Let me talk a little bit about lifting. And again, let's go back to neutral posture. So when someone is standing perfectly straight, they can produce their maximum strength. But as they start to bend forward or reach up or bend all the way down to the floor, they can't produce their maximum strength because their shoulder comes out of neutral or their back bends or something like that. So. Um, in this case, just going one foot, and this isn't one foot from the edge of their toes or the edge of their body. This is one foot from their ankle bone, from their spine. It's not very far out. You're already down to a third of your maximum strength that you can produce. Uh, going above shoulder height, going down to the floor near you, you, you lose half your strength. So what, and it, when you lose your strength, you fatigue, you, you um, experience discomfort, and over time you can experience injury. So what can you do? Well, you want to use your full strength by trying to lift things at waist height close to your body. 
if you're working on a cart with a cart, she's at one third of her of her of her maximum strength if she tries to lift that way. But if she walks around, she can increase her producible strength. So either she can do things, she can either slide that towards her, because sliding is a little bit easier, but better yet, she could walk around and pick it up on the other side. This is the risk of injury um, from twisting. And when you twist your back, and I, you know, this winter was uh, really brutal um, up in the northeast, and I did a lot of snow shoveling, and what I did was try to take a step and not turn my body, twist my body every time I threw a, a you know, a shovel of snow. Um, because every time I turned my body like that, it'd go down to like 20, 30% of my maximum strength, and then I had lower back pain. So, um, so um, here you can see this person twisted rather than turning his whole body so it's straight. Here she's trying to be efficient by turning her body. But what you want to do is you want to take a step. So take a step so that um, move things a little bit farther away and take a step rather than trying to twist if you're unloading a card or something like that. So here he's loading or unloading supplies, and it's a good idea to um, take that step. Don't twist. Move it a little farther away. Take a step and also try to put the heavy stuff at waist height. So let me give you just a, a – here's six things to think about that can help your lifting. And some of these we already talked about. Lift close to the body and near waist height. And if you're putting together a stock room, Make sure that the heavy things are at waist height. Move your feet to avoid twisting. Don't twist, but take a step. If you can, and some people can't do this, if you're lifting something off the floor, try to use your leg muscles and not your, your back. And um, if, if it's heavy or in an awkward place, ask for help. It may be a two-person lift. Use carts and keep those carts in good working order and move things with carts instead of carrying them distances. When you are walking with a load or any time you're walking, you want to make sure you're wearing shoes that don't slip. Look out for slip hazards or something that would block your way that you would trip over and resolve problems when you see them. So I think that kind of takes us to the end, and which is good because we'll have plenty of time for questions, is I'd like to talk a little bit about training takeouts. And um, so what are you going to take home with you? And I hope you, you, you take home that working in a neutral posture is a really good thing. You'll be a lot more comfortable at the end of your work day or working at home being in a neutral posture. But you still don't want static posture. You want to vary your posture throughout the day. So look for opportunities to stand and sit and um, stretch during the day and vary your posture. Um, Good, um, use good computer workstation setups. And I think it's hard to see it yourself, but you can see it in a picture. Or maybe you could get together with a coworker and help each other and set up your workstation. So go do your homework. And identify and resolve unsafe lifting conditions. That's the big thing, is if something's unbalanced, you're starting to get something in in a box that's very unbalanced, give somebody some feedback. That, that can hurt you. or um, if there's water on the floor, clean it up. You know, some of those obvious things, rearrange your, your stock rooms so that the heavy stuff is at waist height, uh, all kinds. Get, get good working carts instead of carrying things long distance. All those things are helpful and, of course, stay fit. And so that's the most important thing there is strengthening ab and upper body, but also good nutrition, getting good sleep, all of those good things. So that brings us to the end of this presentation, which is good because I wanted to end in 40 minutes to give plenty of time for questions. Um, and just remember that work-related musculoskeletal injury can be prevented. And so, um, uh, you know, do your part. And if there's something you see a risk and you can't do anything about it, feed that back to your manager and supervisor. And so um, let me um, – I'm not sure – I can see questions, but I can hear them if you would like to just ask me. And the other thing is if your question doesn't get answered or if you have a question later, here is my contact information. So please feel free to email me, and I'm more than happy to answer any questions that you have. So with this, I'm going to open up for questions, and if you could just ask them to me, um, um, you know, just speak them, that would be great. 
and uh, we're ready to go. Anybody have a question? That was really great. I enjoyed it. Thank you. You mentioned that we could get the PowerPoint um, in a downloadable version. How do I do that? Um, Terry, can you answer that? I think it was available when you uh, registered. Is that correct, Terry, or not? Yes, Terry, that's correct. Uh, when, when Donna sent the uh, notice out, she attached it. So the first register, the first email that we got back after registration. Yes. Okay. Awesome. Thank you. I had a question. Can you speak at all to uh, light levels in an office? Oh, I'm glad you asked that question. Thank you. Yes, the problem with light levels in an office is that when you're 30 and when you're 60, um, when you're 60, you need twice as much light as when you're 30 years old. So when the, you have common light um, in an office, it's going to be driving the younger people crazy and the older people aren't going to have enough light. Um, and typically that's what happens because that's one of the aging factors is your, um, you need a little bit more light. You're also more sensitive to glare. So what I would recommend is um, if that's a problem to um, turn off or, or if they're fluorescent bulbs, you have to take them out together. But to talk to um, building and grounds, talk to your department head and get the lights taken out above your cubicle if they're bothering you and then get a directed light. Or if you're somebody who, if you want more light, or you could leave it and then just use a directed light to get additional light. Same thing for somebody who doesn't want that much light, they can control their light by using a, a directed lamp, and that works. The other thing to think about is glare, and typically computers should be perpendicular to the light source, but look to see if your windows really need blinds or shades, um, sometimes you can just tape a folder or a board to the side of the computer or the top to give it a little bit of shade. But glare is a problem because people tend to um, bend their, their heads and their neck forward and squint to look through it. Um, I'm not that crazy about glare filters. Sometimes they're used for privacy filters um, because they tend to pick up, they're electrostatic, they pick up a lot of fingerprints and dust and that people have to really squint to see through them. They also kill some of the contrast. Uh, is that helpful? Very much, thank you. Sure. What are your thoughts on um, stand-up workstations? Um, I actually just did a presentation uh, for National, uh, the New England College of Occupational Medicine on st standing stations. They there's some really good ones out there. I think they're a good idea, but I'm not sure that everybody needs one. So there's kind of a proc, there's sort of a process with a standing station. If you think you need a standing station, um, first you have to figure out why, because sometimes standing isn't going to isn't going to help. So if it's the way you're using your mouse, it's not going to help. So you should fix first what you have and make sure that you, all the things we've talked about here, that you're comfortable seated. Then the next thing is you should try a standing station to see if you would use it. And you can do that again with paper reams and rubber bands and make the, the keyboard at elbow height with your shoulders relaxed and get your monitor up higher and try it and see if you like it. Some people don't like it. Um, and um, it can actually make their issues more you know, they can lower back issues more so. You also want to make sure you have the right shoes and you're standing on a mat and you're varying your standing posture using um, some kind of book or, or, or footrest. So you're also standing, varying your standing posture. So try it, and if you benefit from it, there are a lot of them out there on the market. Some of them just sit right on the table and they go up and down. And they range from, some of them are about $400, and they probably, I mean, the height adjustable tables and a desk size is about $1,200, so just to tell you the range. That said, if I was putting in a new um, installation, I would put this everywhere. I would have height adjustable tables as the standard if um, a department could afford them, and the prices of them are coming down. So if I was putting in a new desk, I would put it in height adjustable. 
and that way the people that needed it would have it right there. The other uh, uh, advantage of a height adjustable table is people seated can get in the right height. Does that help? Yes. Good. Can you speak to climate control? Um, when you're in a hot and humid environment, that aggravates, um, that can aggravate uh, your, whatever your cumulative trauma, your, your, your musculoskeletal discomfort is, likewise when it's very cold. So you want to look to try to have reasonable climate control, and I know for some of the work you do that's difficult, so that may have to be done with, with uh, clothing, um, but you want to try to not be too cold or too hot and humid. Um, I don't know if that, is that helpful? Yes, thank you. Okay. Um, I have a question. What about using a laptop in your your bedroom, like actually on your bed with one of those cushions behind you that have the arms and then one of those those desks, those like um, little tabletops that you can sit the laptop on? What's your take on that? There's some really great products in the market for that. It's like a table and it's got, um, you can sit on either side of you, there's support and it tilts up. I wouldn't do long-term work on that but I would certainly do something short. So, I mean, if you're comfortable, do it for a short period of time, but you wouldn't want to do that for an hour or two hours, I don't think. Okay. Um, a lot ergonomics is not prescriptive. It is a lot about comfort, and people's body types are different. There are also some people that have to work reclined, and that may be the best that they can get, that they can do. So see how it works for you, but I wouldn't make that your regular work workstation. Okay. Thank you. Sure. All right. We have some technical issues starting out. Can we get a copy of this presentation sent to our park? Um, yes. There, it's a, there's a PDF that's available um, when you first um, uh, signed up for this class, is that correct, Terry? What, what is that, Terry? I'm oh, sorry. oh, they had some technical difficulties, one of the person that's calling in, and they want to copy the presentation, but it's available. And if, it's, if you don't, if you can't find it, um, send me an email and I'll send you a, a, a version, a PDF. Thank you. Okay. Uh, Terry, can you tell me, is there any evidence to suggest that that viewing a computer monitor eight to ten hours at a stretch does any damage to the retina or is there any um, advice that you have about dimming the screen and that sort of thing in terms of impact on the eye? You know, I, I don't have an answer to that. I don't know. Um, if you write me the question to this email address, I can see if there's some good articles on it, but I personally don't know. Okay, thank you. Are there any more questions? Are there any more questions? Would you like to sign out? Uh, yeah, Terry. Thank you yeah. so much for the training. It was awesome.
Um, just like the first one, we really appreciate it. And it was a lot of valuable information passed on. So we appreciate it again. Thank you so much. Oh, my Thank pleasure. You from Death Valley. Oh, hello? Thank you from Death Valley. Oh, cool. <laughs> Okay, Terry, so we'll be in touch with you. Great. Great. Thank you. Have a good day. You have a good day, too. Thank you. Bye-bye. Okay, bye.